Blood is what keeps us alive. It's what brings nutrients and oxygen to every cell in the human body. Blood is what allows us to move around and exercise. Without it, we wouldn't survive. And yet, many people, and especially young, fit and healthy people, do not donate blood. Why is that? There are many reasons why someone might decide to not donate their blood, and a popular one among casual gym goers, bodybuilders and professional endurance athletes alike is the fear of decreasing their performance and potentially missing out on gains. But is this fear actually warranted? Are blood donations and weightlifting really so incompatible with one another? In this video, I'm going to tell you what the latest sports science has to say about this and I'm also going to take you with me to my next blood donation. To understand why blood donations are a thing and why we need them, we first have to understand what they're actually for. If a person loses blood during an accident or during regular surgery, this blood needs to be replaced and that's where blood donations come in. Another use case for blood donations are when they, as a whole product, or the individual components of whole blood are used for the treatment of certain diseases such as cancer. And in Switzerland alone, 700 blood donations are used up every Every single day. So that's a whole lot of blood that they need every day. But where does this come from? It's certainly not coming from the lab because blood can currently not be synthesized in a lab. And that's why all these blood banks and hospitals rely on real blood from real human beings. Another problem is that blood cannot be stored indefinitely. For example, the red blood cells, so the cells that transport oxygen throughout your body, they have a shelf life of around 42 to 49 days. After that, they have to be discarded. And that's why there needs to be a constant supply and resupply of these blood donations in order to keep stocks full. However, a very low percentage of people actually donates their blood. In Switzerland, it's around 2.5% and the world average is between 2 and 3%, so that's not a whole lot of people. The Red Cross and the WHO actually estimate that we would need around double that to ensure a constant and secure supply. So if we take this short shelf life of blood products and combine it with the reluctance of many people to donate their blood, we'll end up with a chronic shortage of blood products. And this is not good. Just have have a look at this graph. This shows you how much blood they currently have in reserve in Switzerland as a whole. And for only two blood groups out of eight, the stocks are at normal or even high levels. All other stocks will run out in the next four to six days if they're not replaced. Where does this reluctance of people to donate their blood come from? There are certainly many reasons. Maybe one simple answer is just inconvenience because you have to go somewhere and sacrifice some of your precious time. Another reason that I see a lot, especially in the fitness community, is that people are afraid blood donations will somehow impair their progress and to some point they are absolutely right. However, they're also missing the big picture here. When it comes to performance, red blood cells are an important factor. So these cells pick up oxygen at your lungs and transport it and distribute it through your entire body. These cells are also the main cellular component of your blood. So when you donate half a liter of your blood, that will reduce your red blood cell count and fewer red blood cells means less oxygen transport, less oxygen transport means reduced performance. And this has actually been shown by science as well. In two recent meta-analyses, they found that two to seven days after your blood donation, your maximum oxygen uptake capacity, or VO2 max, is decreased by 7 to 10 percent. And while this might sound like a lot, it's important to keep a few things in mind. Just because these findings were statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean they're also important for our daily lives. For endurance athletes, these 7 to 10 percent can certainly make a huge difference and can decide whether they perform well in a competition or not. However, for someone who's just working out as a hobby, it might not be that relevant after all. Also, because VO2 max is affected, endurance athletes might experience a reduction in their performance. However, for people who are into strength training, it might actually not be that relevant. 
and you might still feel a bit fatigued but it's probably comparable as if you hadn't slept enough the night before. What's more is that performance will be restored within one or two weeks. So the sheer volume that you lose during the blood donation is replaced within the next 24 hours. Your immune cells will take another one or two days until they reach normal levels again and your red blood cell count in the blood will be restored after one week. What does that mean for you? In concrete terms that means that you might feel a little bit more fatigued and you might have to adjust your training a little bit to accommodate to these higher fatigue levels and maybe it's a good idea to not donate blood the day before a competition. However with all that said I think if you're not a professional athlete then the performance drop that comes after a blood donation should not be the reason why you're not donating blood. If you still have other reasons why you don't want to donate blood then that's perfectly fine whether or not you donate your blood is your decision and yours only. However, the performance drop shouldn't be a reason because it's small, it's probably not even noticeable that much and it's only three to four weeks every year given that you donate regularly. And in the context of full year of training, these three to four weeks in which you cannot train optimally are probably not going to hurt your progress in the long term. And that's why I personally have decided that I want to donate my blood on a regular basis because it can literally save someone else's life. And I know I'd be grateful if I were in the position of needing blood transfusions if there actually was someone who donated their blood for me. So I've donated my blood already several times in the last years and today I've scheduled my next blood donation. So if you're still unsure or you want to know how this whole process works and what it looks like to lose a pint of blood, join me during my blood donation. So, all right, um, I'm on my way to the blood donation center. If you're wondering, there's a park nearby. That's why I'm in a park. But I wanted to cover a few things before I get there. The first thing is who can actually donate blood because that's important information, right? In Switzerland, there are a few requirements uh, for donating blood. So you have to be healthy. You need to be between 18 and 65 years old and you need to weigh at least 50 kilograms. Uh, so I think that's 110 pounds because that's for your own safety because the the heavier you are, the more blood you have. But if you fall below that 50 kilogram threshold, donating blood and giving away 500 milliliters might not be so good for you. That's for that. There are some exclusion criteria that either permanently or temporarily exclude you from donating blood. For example, if you are HIV positive, that will result in a permanent ban because you don't want to give infectious contaminated blood to any patients. However, there are also some criteria that can lead to you having to wait a certain time period until you can donate blood. Examples here would be if you had a dentist's appointment, then you cannot donate blood for the next 72 hours. Whether you are a suitable donor or not will be determined once you get there because you have to answer some questions in a questionnaire and according to the answers you give, they will check if you are a suitable blood donor. If you don't want to go there and risk being rejected as a blood donor, you can also go to the internet. I linked some resources down below. You can check there what criteria they list if you can donate blood. And then before you go and donate your blood, make sure that you've eaten something so you don't go there with an empty stomach. <laughs> if you haven't eaten something, they'll make you eat something before. That's just to make sure that your blood sugar is high enough. The next thing is, and that's probably more important even, is that you drink enough, whatever that might be, water, some Coca-Cola, some iced tea, some tea, some coffee, whatever. Just that you have enough fluid in you to also then compensate the loss of fluid during the blood donation. But with that all said, let's donate some blood. All right, so I'm at the blood donation center right now. And the first thing that you do after registration is you have to fill out this questionnaire. So it's a total of one and a half pages or 18 questions with some sub questions. And some of the questions are really basic, such as if you've ever donated blood before, if you weigh a minimum of 50 kilograms, if you feel healthy at the moment, things like that. However, other questions get a bit more personal. Um, so they ask you if you take certain medication, for example, or if you currently suffer or have ever suffered from certain diseases. Um, 
um, they even ask you about your sex life. So you might feel like these questions are very invasive and to be honest they are. However, it's very important that you answer all of these questions and that you answer them honestly because these are the basis for them to decide if you are a suitable blood donor at all or at the moment. And what makes you a suitable donor? So first of all, the safety of yourself as a donor is very important. So with questions like if you feel healthy, if you've had a fever in the past weeks, for example, they make sure that you are currently healthy enough to donate half a liter of your blood. However, they also ask these questions for the patient's safety. So the person who then receives the blood donation, because if you suffer from certain diseases uh, like HIV or hepatitis, you could infect that blood recipient. Of course, you don't want to harm them. The whole point of donating your blood is to help another person out and potentially save their lives, not make it worse, right? So that's what these questions are for. And that's why it's very important to answer them completely and honestly. Another thing is that regardless of your answers here, if you are allowed to donate blood, they will test it regardless. And of course, if then it turns out that you lied about some of these questions, they have to discard your blood, which would be a waste of your time, your blood, their time and their resources. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fill this out because you have to fill it out each and every time to exclude any reasons why you can't donate blood at the moment. So let me do that. So here I am walking to my medical checkup. They will quickly check your heart rate, blood pressure and also hemoglobin to make sure that you are fit enough at the moment to donate blood. And checking is especially important since this is the protein that actually binds to the oxygen and transport it through your body. So they want to make sure that you have enough of it and don't run into any issues after your donation. But the doc said everything is okay. So I'm free to donate half a liter of my blood. As I know it, you lie down and then they will just search for a vein in your arm, prep it um, and here the nurse is prepping me so they just disinfect everything and then the biggest and the most important part is to just poke the needle in your arm and draw some blood. And actually, although this is a fat big ass needle, it actually didn't hurt at all. So when they took some blood from my finger to check for hemoglobin, that hurt way more uh, than this. And the blood drawing is very quick, so it'll take around 10 minutes to fill this bag with my blood. But now I'm done. You're asked to keep sitting for a few minutes and drink something that they'll provide. And once you feel okay, you are ready to go. All right, so I just came back in and out. It took me around 45 minutes, so it's not a lot of time. I also got some snacks, so a um, protein bar and some chocolate and some, so something to drink. Food and drink are often for free and they're often provided by the blood donation center. What you get really depends on them. Sometimes when I went before, I got some fruit or maybe even some sandwiches. So it really comes down to what they currently have and also what time of day it is. Why they do that, of course, to to give you some goodies but also because it's very important that you fuel your body so it takes around 2,000 to 3,000 calories to replace the blood that you just donated and also to keep hydrated to replace the volume the liquid that you lost and in fact the blood plasma so the liquid part of your blood is replaced within 24 hours the white blood cells so your immune cells also recover within one or two days and the red blood cells will take around a week to come to original levels again but because of this lack of red blood cells and because blood plasma needs to be replaced it's recommended that around 24 hours after your blood donation you don't work out so if you want to work out either do it before your blood donation or do it the day after but that's actually it so there's not a lot that you need to consider so i'm gonna eat my protein 
protein bar and drink something before I carry on with my day. I hope it was interesting for you to see how the whole process of blood donation work and I hope I could take away some fear or some residual reluctance and if this video just motivated one surreal person to go and donate their blood that would be bloody fantastic. So let me know in the comments below if you have ever donated blood if you consider doing so and I see you in the next video. Bye!